the thought that's going through my head at that age is, huh, he's a better driver than my dad is. And by the way, my dad is a better driver than all my friends' dads. So I recognized there were drivers and then there were better drivers. And I guess I, I kind of went, I want to be a better driver. Can we talk about the, uh, there is nothing away from the track. <laughs> it, and, and literally that, that has, I guess that's really been my life. It's everything that I've done at the track. And I was actually talking to somebody not too long ago and they were asking how I got started. And you know, my dad took me to a race when I was five years old. And apparently that night I informed my parents that I was gonna be a race car driver. And luckily I've never really grown up. So that's, uh, yeah. I. Currently spend my pretty much when I'm not at the track, I'm either thinking about being at the track, working at getting back to the track, working at helping a driver get back to the track, writing about the track, uh, writing about cars on the track. I mean, that's all there is really. When I'm not at the track and I do have those few moments at home, I do like going hiking. It's a great place. It is amazing how many times I've written uh, an article or part of a book on my phone while walking on a hiking trail. And I know that's wrong, but I just get ideas while I'm walking and I start, I just type myself little notes and I have come back from a hike and going, oh, I got three articles written here right now. So um, I do like, I do like going hiking. Uh, you know, I, I, I would like to have more time to do some other things like flying. I, started trying to take my helicopter lessons uh, two years ago and then last year kind of something interrupted that and hopefully I'll get back to that again because uh, I'd say flying a helicopter is the closest thing that I've done to driving a race car. Um, not from a risk perspective, at least I hope not, um, <laughs> but uh, from a coordination skill perspective, um, from that perspective, it, it was, and I got to say, it was one of the most, uh, it, it was fantastic to go and be a beginner again. Like I knew nothing about aviation. I didn't know, you know, I had to learn about weather and radio calls and airport codes and all sorts of stuff that I'll probably never, ever need to know again. But uh, it was fantastic to go and learn something completely new again. And it actually, I, I, I believe it made me, it's made me a better coach. Well, first of all, I'd say that that would put me negative two IQ points in. So, I mean, it, it's actually interesting uh, how many drivers, so, some drivers can drive in a car on a track and they can carry on a full conversation. And it sounds like they're sitting in their living room having a conversation with you. Other drivers are, their blurts of language that comes out while they're driving is almost not impossible. It's almost impossible to understand. And you ask them one question and their brain just completely overloads. So I've seen that, uh, that whole thing. I've seen, I've seen some good and some, a lot of bad as well. Fortunately, my wife loves racing as much as I do. Uh, she probably the only the only complaint that I think I've ever had during uh, during our years of being together, and that is over thirty six years now. Um, uh, although we joke that uh, we say, well, if we've been together, we've been married for thirty six years. It's actually only been sixteen years that we've actually been together because the other years I've been on the road somewhere. But uh, no, the only complaint that I've ever had from Robin is me going to a track and her not being able to come. And she she loves being at the racetrack. She loves racing as much as I do. So, and, and I will say that, you know, we have a daughter that uh, is not into racing. She, she loves racing when I raced, uh, but you know, she would, she would not sit down and watch a race. She's interested in it. She knows a lot about it, but uh, she's not really into it. But 
there were years when she was really small, when uh, my wife would put a photo of me on the back of the seat in the car so that while she was riding around in her car seat, she'd be looking at a photo of me so she'd recognize me when I came home. The sound, the smell, the colors, uh, you know, it's, it's a sensory overload when you're, a, I mean, I'm going to say it is all the time, but as a five-year-old to go there and just the sound and so this was on a, a short oval track, um, probably a, it was either a quarter or three eighths mile oval track with, you know, kind of sprint cars, super modifieds, that kind of thing. And, you know, it's just, it's all in front of you. And it's just, it's a sensory blast of, you know, different color cars. And of course, you know, I love the yellow car. It just, you know, I, I can still see that car today and the sound and the smell of the fumes, the exhaust fumes. Yeah, I will say that uh, it was probably, I was probably 10, 11, 12 years old, somewhere in that range. When I was at my dad's shop, this driver shows up and he's driving an Austin Healey 3000. Just to this day, I still believe it's one of the most gorgeous, beautiful cars ever built. He shows up and he says, do you want to go for a ride? Well, of course I do, right? So we go blasting off and the sound of that Austin Healey going up through all four gears, but then him, then him reaching up and clicking the switch to go to the electric overdrive and it goes, you know, that sound. Uh, and, and riding around with him and I'm thinking, the thought that's going through my head at that age is, huh, he's a better driver than my dad is. And by the way, my dad is a better driver than all my friends' dads. So I recognized there were drivers and then there were better drivers. And I guess I, I kind of went, I want to be a better driver. And that clicked with me at 10, 11, 12. I don't know why something lack of something in my brain or some weird connection that goes on up in there. Excuse me, well, I'll, I'll take a little story time here, but uh, uh, one of these cars, one of the cars crashed, basically knocked the wall down in turn one or two of the oval track, like or flew over the top of the wall or something. It was like one of those big, you know, things that you see in short track oval racing. And a few years later, the driver of that car ended up connecting with my dad who had a shop and my dad ended up preparing, building his race cars. And that fellow ended up driving cars that my dad built and prepared. So for years, I'd be going to the track with this driver who was at that first race that I ever saw who had crashed in that corner. When I was 17 ish or so, uh, he was still racing. My dad was still prepping his car and his he, he kidney failure. Doctor said, you can't race anymore. So he turned and he looked at me because I'd just come back. I'd just gone to the Jim Russell racing school. He says, you just been to a racing school. You drive my car. So the guy that I saw in my very first race was the guy that basically gave me my first ride in a proper race in a race car. So it's kind of how weird how all that ended up happening that way. Sure. <laughs> if you hang out at a racetrack, eventually things happen. So the, the good and the bad news is, is I went to drive this car. It was a super modified 650 horsepower, 12, 1300 pound car on a, thir on a, a three eighth mile oval. I go out and I get like six laps of practice. I qualify, I qualify 18th, which means out of 36 cars, which means I am now the, I'm the slowest of the A group. And they have an A heat and a B heat. The B heat runs, the A heat comes up and they invert the grid. I'm starting on pole for my very first race. 
And there are drivers that are around me who I'd grown up watching and two of them in that field had actually raced at Indianapolis in the 500 in the 60s. Um, and they throw the green flag and I can actually feel me getting bumped by some cars behind it, but I'm just getting faster and faster and faster. And they throw the checker flag and I win. So that pretty much determined that I'm going to keep doing this. And so we, I ran some races in that series that year and then we blew a couple of engines and uh, ran out of money. And that was the end of my oval track racing career as that part. But a year later when I could afford to buy a Formula Ford, uh, maybe it was almost two and a, almost two years later before I could do that. Um, there's a funny story there as well that I borrowed money from a bank, got a bank loan to buy this car. And they asked what kind of car it was. And I said, it was a Ford. And they wanted to know what kind it was a Ford Taiga. It's a British Ford. And they wanted the serial number. And of course, the serial number of a race car is like four digits long. And they're like, no, the rest of the, the rest of the serial. No, it's just, it's a limited production car. They didn't know it was a race car. <laughs> they didn't ask though either. Yeah, that's what you do, isn't it? I mean, it's a smart decision. So, yeah. So anyways, I raced the Formula Ford for a couple of years, won a couple of championships, won a, got a ride in a Formula Atlantic car from a local guy that was actually building his own Formula Atlantic cars and kind of kept moving up the ranks. And then my career pretty much kind of stalled or plateaued with some, a, a couple of pro Atlantic races and a lot of uh, club Atlantic races. And then a team that ran a Trans Am car, did a few Trans Am races. And for probably eight years or so, just kind of struggling, trying to put deals together to drive for somebody and always ended up driving for low budget teams. I was at that point where I, I, had, a, I had the experience that a lot of young drivers have to go to make that move into indie cars but it was spread that experience was spread over eight years rather than two years and uh, but fortunately um indycar decided to have an indycar race in my hometown of vancouver and a group of enthusiasts got together and said wouldn't it be cool to have one of our own in our own first race so they helped put some funding together that uh, got me a ride in that first IndyCar race in Vancouver. And then it was just thrashing for years, trying to put money together and sponsors deals together to keep funding that. And, uh, you know, I sort of funded it to the level of being the least funded drivers driver in the series and having not the most competitive cars, but having gained a some great experience. The magic happened about the time when I was starting to realize that Roger Penske probably wasn't going to give me a call because I just hadn't been able to shine through on these low budget deals. Um, the phone call did come through and it was from an IMSA sports car team that said, we'd like you to come and test. And we'd like you to test our prototype car at Sebring for three days. And we've got a, you know, we have a new engineer, we've got a new car, we want you, we'd like you to do the, the testing and development on this car and this is what we're willing to pay you and i'm like pay me um <laughs> and uh so you know after years of struggling i finally got paid i think quite well to drive uh prototype sports cars in imsa so there was a time and i don't remember the exact number but there was a time one season where i actually calculated the number of hours that I spent working to get into the car versus the hour that I spent in the car. And it's like thousands of hours for that one hour in the car. But that one hour in the car makes that those thousands of hours worth it many times over. And there was one time when there was a, there was a person who was um, sponsoring a couple of young Formula Atlantic drivers. 
and they were racing at Sonoma Sears Point at the time, and uh, I had no ride, but I had a old beat up Honda Civic, and I had been working my one job that I had in my life, and I got to Friday night, and at the end, I got off work, and I got in my Honda, and I drove to Sonoma, drove to Sears Point, which is how was it then, Vancouver? To, it was like about a 15 hour drive or something. Drove straight through the night, got there Saturday morning, basically slept in my car, um, walked around the track, determined to meet this person. Uh, at like five o'clock that afternoon, finally found the person. They said, yeah, let's talk tomorrow morning at 11 o'clock at the track here, this tram transporter. And so I, crawled back into my Honda Civic, slept overnight in the car again, no shower, no, you know, trying to clean myself up in the bathrooms at the track to then go and meet this person and basically got the answer of, oh, that's interesting. I'm glad you made the commitment to come down here. Um, not sure I can help you, but we'll stay in touch. Nothing ever happened of it. I got back in my car, drove back home, got to bed at, you know, four in the morning, got up a couple hours later and went to work again, right? So that's the kind of stuff that I'm, you know, I'm not sure everybody understands that kind of stuff. And believe me, every driver has gone through that kind of stuff. People think that it's all natural talent, but it's what you do with the natural talent. And uh, I, I, rather than, you know, there being some magic DNA gene that, that makes people know how to drive a car, I think what makes a difference is the gene or the DNA or the upbringing that gives somebody the work ethic to make the commitment to do what it takes. You know, I look at a guy like Scott Dixon, six time IndyCar champion, one of the greatest IndyCar drivers of all time. I don't think there's anybody in the series that works harder at being as good as he is than he does. So is that all natural talent? I don't know. Uh, great question. <laughs> I, 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 the, I, will, I will admit that there have been times in my career where I questioned that, said, why? You know, there are easier ways to make a living. But, uh, you know, for me personally, and, and I, th I find it interesting, just the number of reasons why people get involved in motorsport. And, you know, I mean, not just pro racing, but you know, racing RC cars to, you know, autocross to like every type of the sport or, you know, track days where it's non-competitive. Everybody's got a different reason for being there. And, you know, what drives me is, I think, is the challenge. It's, it's the, how do I do this better? And I'm a, I'm kind of competitive. <laughs> and you know, I've always said, you know, some people race to be the fastest. I race to be in front of you. Uh, I, I don't care if I'm the slowest driver on the track. In fact, if I'm the slowest driver on the track, but I'm in front of you, that proves that I'm even smarter than you. So uh, I, to me, it's the wheel to wheel racing that I get the biggest kick out of. I love going to a track and driving a car and, you know, having the car dance on the edge and all that feeling of, of just being connected with the car and the track and all that part of it. But there's a point where if I do that long enough, I almost get bored and I go, yeah, but give me somebody to do this against. Like I want to, I want to race wheel to wheel with somebody doing the same thing. But I also know that there are people that do it for the opposite reasons and for other reasons. So I think what I love about the sport, one of the things I love about the sport is the fact that there is something here for practically everybody. My world revolves around speedsecrets.com. Everything I do is there. So if you're interested in anything that I do, go to speedsecrets.com. And yeah, social media, all that kind of stuff. But I do have something I'm working on for sim racers because I, the sim racing world is only going to grow. It's only going to expand. And I love the competition that's happening online. And it's fantastic stuff. And I have a couple other consulting projects that I'm involved in that keep challenging my brain to come up with new and different ways of looking at the sport. And 
I would say the last thing is that every now and then I get to go to events at different tracks. And the highlight for me of those things is when I get a chance, somebody comes up and goes, hey, I read your book 10 years ago, or I listened to your podcast last week and I got a question. And I, I love that interaction. So if you're out there and I'm at a track somewhere, please come say hi, say hi to me. So. So as Ross says, if you're ever at the track, go and say hello. He's a super nice guy and so easy to talk to. So Ross mentioned the sim racing school and I wanted to talk about that a little bit. So I do sim racing when I'm not able to get to the track. And here is an example of the coverage done by the PCA Sim Racing League. Up to his outside as they come down to the braking for the horseshoe. Can he get this pass done? into the first turn no he breaks a little bit early down to his inside spence takes a look we got a car spinning off two of them out into the grass it's a fantastic organization and the races are so well done it looks like the rest of the field is going to be safely through this is something i do on a weekly basis and this is based in eye racing look how real that looks but also listen to the coverage and listen to those announcers this is streamed live every week on a wednesday it's so much fun to partake in i fully encourage you to go and check it out He's going to try and get it going once again as well. Up into Oak Tree for the first time. Mark Lacombe with clear track in front of him. It looks like Adam Chick has had a problem. I've tried a few simulators and games over the years, but by far iRacing is the best I've found. I find that all the skills that I'm able to build up in iRacing I can take to the track. And I really find that helps me, especially in the off-season when I can't make it to the track. Well, he's certainly had some issues, but out of all those cars that got into trouble, only two of them found themselves on pit lane with a toe. That's it. Right away on the power here, passing back up by the pit exit. It's going to be harder here for Briggs to get this work around the outside, but he's going to go for it, trying to dive in late on the brakes. Not able to get it done. Now maybe looking for a little bit of a crossover. Nope, nothing. So anyway, like I say, go and check out this race. The link is below as well as the link for the PCA Sim Racing. See Joe, an absolute hornet's nest out here. You can see all the drivers working their way up in. If people like this and they like their format, please like, share and subscribe. And any comments you might have, put them down below. And if you've got a question for Ross, either connect with him directly, and I definitely encourage you to do that, or put it down below and we'll see what we can do in, get, in terms of getting those questions answered. But Ross, it's been a great pleasure this evening. Um, it's, I love hearing the stories and talking to you. You're always very gracious. I'm always very humbled by just uh, being in your presence and uh, really look forward to uh, everything else that you might come up with in the future. Well, thanks, Adam. And uh, let's go to a track. Let's go play. I think we need to. When are we doing it? Next week? Uh, I, I'm game. And I'm in Colorado this weekend. I might be able to sneak over to High Plains Raceway if you're in the area. Uh, I'll see what I can do. I got a, you know, I got a little detour maybe on my way to Watkins Glen. I'll see if I can make that work. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, Russ, thanks again and uh, have a great night. Thanks. Have fun. You know, I go to I go to an Indy car race and Johnny Rutherford, who's won Indy three times, comes up to me and puts his arm around me and calls me one of the crispy critters because he's been burnt. I've been burnt. And there's a group of Indy car drivers that, you know, we're the crispy critters.